There is no rational way to explain the remarkable circumstances that led to the liberation of the old city of Jerusalem in 1967. It was one of the most unexpected and inexplicable phenomena in the history of human warfare. There was no battle plan for Jerusalem whatsoever. Israeli intelligence never expected the impending confrontation to include Jordan, which had been in control of the old city since 1948. In the south, Jamal Abdel Nasser of Egypt, in contravention of international law, had closed the Straits of Tehran and sent 100,000 troops and thousands of tanks into the demilitarized Sinai Peninsula, a clear act of war. Tensions were also building on the Syrian border in the north. Israel expected a war in two fronts, north and south, but certainly not with Jordan in the east. Unbeknown to Israel, Jordan had signed an agreement with Egypt, placing the entire Jordanian army under the direct command of Egypt's chief of staff, General Riyadh. It was Nasser's plan to unleash a triple-pronged attack from Egypt, Jordan and Syria, which he believed the young state of Israel could not defend, and he would finally avenge the defeat of 1948. On the first day of the war, the Jordanian forces began shelling major cities across Israel, including heavy bombardment of Jewish West Jerusalem. Israel repeatedly implored the Jordanians to cease fire and promised they would not react. Once all diplomatic attempts failed, Israel had no choice but to defend herself and enter the unplanned fray in Jerusalem. Rabbi Yol bin Nun, a member of the Paratrooper Reserve Brigade 55 under the command of Motagur, recalls the surprising change in plan. On the first day of the war, he and his fellow soldiers were en route to El Arish in Sinai when they received an urgent command to redirect to Jerusalem. The IDF now had only a few hours to familiarize themselves with the routes and topography in and around the capital. With only partial intelligence, a dire lack of East Jerusalem maps and in complete darkness, the troops charged into battle at 2 a.m. early Tuesday morning in the second day of the war. It was then the paratroopers engaged in the fierce battles of Ammunition Hill, the American colony, and Vadi Joz, and suffered the worst day of losses in their unit's entire history, losing 100 soldiers in these battles. In comparison, the very same brigade fought for two weeks in the Yom Kippur War and lost 52 soldiers, half of those lost on this one blood-drenched day. However, despite the heavy price, Brigade 55, together with the Harel and Jerusalem Brigades, had almost surrounded the old city. That very night, Motagur had a breathtaking conversation with Rabbi Shlomo Goren, the chief rabbi of the RDF. While in the Rockefeller Museum at the northeastern tip of the old city, awaiting orders, the rabbi said to him, Mota, Jewish history obligates you to liberate the old city. Mota replied that while he draws great inspiration from Jewish history, he takes his orders only from his superiors. Mota, said Rav Goren, Jewish history will not forgive a Jewish commander who had the opportunity to reclaim Jerusalem and did not do so. Moshe Dayan, the defense minister in the unity government, had ordered them not to capture the old city for two reasons. Firstly, the intention of this defensive war was never to conquer the old city and its holy sites, sacred to many religions. Secondly, he was aware of the large Jordanian military presence in the old city, especially on the Temple Mount, with huge amounts of artillery and ammunition. Having seen the devastating losses on that one day, Dayan anticipated much greater losses in hand-to-hand -hand street combat, especially in defense of the holy places. This would be a battle that Israel would not fight, or so he thought. What he did not realize was, in Rav Soloveitchik's famous words, that divine destiny was knocking at the door. The drama of Jewish destiny was about to unfold. That very same night, two utterly unexpected and unpredictable events occurred. The first, in a remarkable display of unity, left-wing Yigal Alon and Menachem Begin from the right came together as one to Prime Minister Levi Eshkol to intercede on behalf of Jerusalem. Now was the time to liberate the holy city. The emergency cabinet heavily debated the issue, with many concerned that the world would not tolerate a Jewish conquest of Jerusalem and that Israel should not attack. Eventually, Moshe Dayan's decision was overruled and the cabinet gave the green light. It was time to return to Jerusalem for the first time in 2,000 years, at any cost. At that very same time, another dramatic decision was being made. The commander of the Jordanian troops in the old city, sensing the inevitable and realizing it was surrounded, requested permission to retreat over the Mount of Olives and back over the Jordan River. General Riyadh gave his approval and the Jordanians fled that very same evening. Our sages describe how Jerusalem is the only city in the world that exists on two planes, in heaven and on earth. 
Jerusalem on high and Jerusalem down below. Nothing happens in Jerusalem on high unless it happens concurrently in Jerusalem below. Perhaps at the very moment of both debates between the rabbi and the commander and within the cabinet in the city below, a similar debate was taking place in the heavenly cabinet. Were the Jewish people worthy of returning to Yerushalayim, Ira Kodesh? Was this the moment they'd been waiting for for 2,000 years? Would they have to wait 2,000 more? Would there be more devastating loss of life in a battle on the mountain of God? Or would there be a more merciful outcome? As we know, divine mercy won the day. Am Yisrael would not have to wait any longer and little blood would be spilt on that epic day in Jerusalem in June 1967. The hand of heaven was moving history forward. When Motagur positioned himself on the Mount of Olives the next morning, preparing for the battle of his life, he was astounded. There was barely a Jordanian soldier in sight. After a few minor skirmishes and mercifully with very little loss of life, Motagur proclaimed the iconic words, Har Habayit Bayadainu, the Temple Mount is in our hands. Israel had accomplished what seemed impossible with all the political predictions and military assessments from just a few days before. The Jewish people had returned home. Extraordinary turn of events is another powerful reminder of the meaning of Jewish life. Our collective journey on earth cannot be separated from our heavenly odyssey. Individual and national master plans cannot be severed from the master's plan. The very existence of Israel and Jerusalem is a constant testimony to the inextricable bond between human history and divine providence, between Jewish destiny and our spiritual destination.